Where do Poles really come from? For centuries, this has been one of Central Europe's biggest mysteries. Some say the Poles arrived during the early Middle Ages, part of a great Slavic migration that moved west. Others believe their roots go much deeper, back to the ancient people who lived along the Vistula River long before Slavs were ever mentioned in history. Now for the first time, DNA is giving us real answers. And what scientists have found is shocking. So stay with me until the end, because we're about to explore the hidden truths of Polish DNA. And before we dive in, let me ask you a question. Do you think Poles arrived through migration, or were they always here? Drop your answer in the comments. For generations, we have been told a simple story about the origins of the Polish people. According to textbooks, the Slavs arrived in Central Europe during the early Middle Ages, around the 5th and 6th centuries. They came from the east, settled the land, and became the ancestors of modern Poles. But when scientists began testing ancient DNA from Polish soil, that story began to fall apart, not partially, but completely. What they found did not suggest a population arriving from elsewhere and replacing what came before. Instead, the genetic evidence pointed to something far more surprising. The people of this land, especially the women, had been here long before the Slavs were ever named in history books. And they never left. When researchers analyzed DNA from ancient graves near the Vistula River, these burials dated back to the Roman Iron Age, centuries before Slavic migrations were supposed to have happened. The expectation was clear. If Slavs arrived later, then ancient DNA should look different from modern Polish DNA. That is not what happened. The mitochondrial DNA, which is passed from mother to child, showed an almost perfect match between women buried nearly 2,000 years ago and women living in Poland today. The same maternal lineages appeared again and again, unchanged, uninterrupted, stretching back over 3,000 years. This was not a small similarity. It was direct continuity. The women who lived, worked, and raised families in Iron Age Poland are genetically linked to modern Polish mothers. If there had been a massive migration that replaced the population, this would not be possible. So the first question emerged. If the Slavs arrived later, why were the mothers already there? When the mothers stay, but the fathers change. As researchers dug deeper, the picture became even more complex. While maternal DNA showed strong continuity, paternal DNA told a different story. The Y chromosome, passed from father to son, revealed a clear shift over time. In the Iron Age, male lineages in Poland were dominated by older European groups associated with northern regions. These lineages were common across large parts of prehistoric Europe, but by the early medieval period, they had almost vanished. In their place appeared a new dominant paternal lineage, known today as R1A, especially certain branches that now make up more than half of Polish male ancestry. This was not a gradual drift, it was a sharp transition. Within a few centuries, the male genetic landscape of the region flipped. This created a strange imbalance. The women remained the same, but the men changed. If there was no population replacement, no disappearance of local women, and no signs of mass violence. How did this shift happen? At first glance, a sudden change in male lineages sounds like conquest, but archaeology tells a different story. There are no widespread signs of destroyed settlements, no layers of ash covering villages, no mass graves pointing to slaughter. Instead, what the evidence suggests is integration. Local women married men who carried different paternal lineages, over generations, these men became socially dominant. Their language spread. Their identity became standard. Their Y chromosomes multiplied. This was not a takeover by force. It was a takeover through family. Children born from these unions inherited their father's language and social identity, but they also carried their mother's ancient genetic legacy. Over time, this process reshaped how people spoke and identified themselves, without erasing who they were biologically. In other words, the culture changed faster than the population. This is how a genetic revolution can happen quietly, without leaving dramatic scars in the ground. 
This brings us to one of the most important ideas in understanding Polish origins. Slavic identity may not have spread because people moved in large numbers. It may have spread because people adopted it. During the collapse of Roman influence in Europe, power structures broke down. Old systems failed. New forms of organization were needed. In these conditions, languages and identities can spread rapidly without armies or invasions. Slavic dialects began to dominate between the 5th and 6th centuries. Older local languages disappeared. Burial customs shifted. Folklore and social rules evolved. But the people themselves did not vanish. Genetic studies comparing Iron Age and early medieval populations across Central Europe show no sudden break in ancestry. Autosomal DNA, which reflects overall genetic makeup from both parents, remained largely stable. What changed was how people described themselves and how they communicated. Slavic identity spread like a cultural wave, not a demographic flood. For many years, the dominant male lineage in Poland, R1A, was assumed to be foreign. It was thought to have arrived from the Eastern Steppe, carried by migrating warriors who brought Slavic culture with them. Recent genetic dating challenged that assumption. When scientists traced the origins of key R1A branches, they found something unexpected. Some of the most common Polish lineages appear to have formed in the region thousands of years earlier, long before medieval migrations. Instead of pointing east, the genetic evidence pointed inward. Poland itself emerged as a central homeland for these lineages. The so-called invaders may have been descendants of people who once lived there, left during earlier upheavals, and later returned. This changes the narrative entirely. Rather than strangers arriving from distant lands, the men associated with early Slavic identity may have been locals reclaiming influence in their ancestral territory. Long before anyone used the word Slav, the land that would become Poland was home to complex societies. During the Bronze Age and Iron Age, these communities farmed, traded, and built lasting settlements. Genetic data from these periods shows the presence of the same paternal lineages that dominate modern Polish populations today. These people were not Slavs in name, but they were ancestors in blood. Later historians labeled some of these cultures as foreign, often based on artifacts or burial styles. Many of these labels were created in the 19th century, shaped by political agendas rather than biological evidence. The people of Iron Age Poland were not replaced. Their descendants are still there. Historical records describe a sudden spread of Slavic peoples across Europe. At first glance, this seems to support the idea of migration. But written sources often exaggerate movement because language change is visible, while genetic continuity is not. Modern linguistics suggests that early Slavic language developed locally over a long period, possibly between the Oder and Dnieper rivers. Once conditions allowed, it spread rapidly, adopted by different communities across vast regions. Ancient local women carried their lineages through every historical change. Male lineages shifted, returned, and reorganized. Language transformed. Identity evolved. What we call Slavic was not born in a single migration. It was shaped slowly through continuity, adaptation, and integration. Up to this point, the genetic story of Poland shows remarkable stability. Ancient mothers remained. Male lineages shifted, but stayed rooted in the same land. Language changed without people disappearing. But once we move south beyond Poland, the pattern begins to change. And this is where the larger Slavic story becomes clearer. When we look at countries like Serbia, Croatia, Bulgaria, and Greece, we still hear Slavic languages. The words sound familiar. The grammar connects back to the same linguistic family. On the surface, it looks like the same story continued southward. Genetically, it did not. In Poland, more than half of men carry the R1, a paternal lineage. In Ukraine and Belarus, it remains strong. But as we move into the Balkans, its presence drops sharply. In Serbia, it falls well below half. In Croatia, it drops further. By the time we reach Greece, it becomes a minority. This difference matters. It tells us that while Slavic language spread widely, the genetic impact of Slavic-associated male lineages weakened 
as they moved into regions that were already densely populated. The Balkans were not an empty landscape waiting to be settled. They were home to ancient populations with deep roots, shaped by thousands of years of local history. When Slavic-speaking groups arrived during the 6th and 7th centuries, they did not replace these populations. They joined them. In Poland, Slavic identity aligned closely with existing genetic structures. In the Balkans, Slavic identity layered itself on top of older genetic foundations. Ancient DNA from Balkan regions shows a clear pattern of blending. Slavic-associated paternal lineages appear, but they mix rapidly with local maternal lines. Over generations, the genetic signal becomes balanced rather than dominant. The result is a population that speaks a Slavic language but carries a genetic profile shaped heavily by earlier inhabitants. This explains why Balkan populations often feel culturally Slavic while remaining genetically distinct from northern Slavs. The language spread further than the bloodline. Burial customs also reflect this difference. In Poland, older Central European traditions continued longer, even as Slavic language spread. In the Balkans, burial practices quickly blended with local Roman and Christian traditions. This contrast helps explain why Polish DNA appears so cohesive, while South Slavic populations show more variation. The answer lies not in migration alone, but in population density and existing social structures. To understand why Poland remained genetically stable, we need to return to the most consistent element in the story, the mothers. Across multiple genetic studies, maternal lineages in Poland show some of the strongest continuity in all of Europe. From the Bronze Age, through the Roman Iron Age, into the medieval period and modern times, the same maternal lines appear again and again. In practical terms, this means that Polish identity was built on an unbroken demographic foundation. New influences arrived, but they entered an existing structure rather than replacing it. For thousands of years, even invasions and cultural shifts failed to break this continuity. But one event came closer than anything else. After the Second World War, Poland's borders were redrawn. Millions of people were forced to move. Entire communities were uprooted and relocated across the country. German populations were expelled westward. Poles from the eastern regions were resettled into areas they had never lived in before. Villages changed names. Cemeteries were abandoned. Regional histories were fractured. This was not gradual migration. It was enforced movement. When researchers examined modern Polish paternal DNA, they noticed something unusual. Regional differences that once existed were flattened. The variation that normally builds up over centuries was suddenly gone. This did not happen because of natural selection or long-term evolution. It happened because entire male populations were removed and replaced through policy decisions. For the first time in thousands of years, continuity was threatened not by invasion or cultural change, but by bureaucracy and war. Despite this disruption, something remarkable happened. The core paternal lineage that had dominated Poland since early medieval times remained strong. R1A did not disappear. In fact, it became even more widespread across the country. The trauma of displacement erased local differences, but it also reinforced national genetic cohesion. Poland became, genetically speaking, more internally similar after the war than it had been before. When scientists analyze Polish DNA today, they see something uncommon in Europe. Instead of scattered clusters reflecting dozens of ancient tribes, Poland appears as a relatively tight genetic group. This does not mean Poland is genetically isolated or pure. It means that its history followed a specific path, one where continuity outweighed disruption for most of its existence. Ancient maternal lines persisted, paternal lines reorganized, but remained rooted. Language and identity evolved without severing the population base. Even the greatest catastrophe in modern history failed to erase this structure. All of this evidence feeds into a debate that has lasted for over a century. One side argues that Slavs were always native to Central Europe, developing locally over thousands of years. The other argues that Slavs arrived later from the East during the early medieval period. Genetics shows that both views are incomplete. There was no single moment when the Slavs appeared. There was no single homeland that explains everything. 
Slavic identity did not arrive fully formed, nor was it frozen in place from prehistory. Instead, it emerged gradually. Ancient populations already living in Central Europe carried the genetic foundations. Language developed locally and spread outward. Social changes allowed one identity to become dominant, while others faded. Poland's genetic story shows that continuity and change are not opposites. They can exist together. And that may be the real meaning behind the Slavic story. Not where it began, but how it endured. In the end, Polish DNA does not tell a story of invasion or replacement. It tells a story of persistence. The history of Poland is a story written across thousands of years, from ancient communities living along the Vistula, through Bronze Age farmers and Iron Age tribes, to the rise of Slavic language, medieval kingdoms, partitions, and modern upheaval. Every chapter has left its mark on the Polish genetic code. If you've enjoyed this journey through the unique DNA of Poland, let us know in the comments. Have you taken a DNA test and discovered Polish roots? Or have you ever wondered where your family's features, traditions, or regional identity come from? Share your story, we'd love to hear it. And don't forget, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe for more content, and hit the notification bell so you never miss an upload. Thanks for watching. Do Zobaczynia next time.